your job as a leader is to create priorities and share those priorities with your people. Smart people, great people want to be led. If you are their leader, they want you to lead them. Nice. And I think that gets missed a lot in this thing. And so I, I've actually seen a lot of people go way too laissez-faire. Yeah. And what we end up with is a lot of really smart people that want to do the right thing, but are not exactly quite sure what to be doing. I'm Steve Shenbaum and welcome to the Good To Do podcast. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, Good To Do. We are amplifying uh, really cool, interesting leaders from a variety of sectors. And the thing that they all have in common, aside from being really interesting, really unique and really cool transformational leaders, is they've taken all this information that we have uh, and they've transferred it into action. They have applied it to make a difference and solve problems. And my hope for you, if you're watching us on YouTube or, or tuning in and listening, I hope a few things happen. I hope you laugh because we love humor. We love to laugh with. I hope you maybe say to yourself or out loud, um, wow, I could do that. Like, that seems tangible. Like, I would love to hear that from you. And I hope you maybe get a pen out and write one or two things down and say, wow, that would really help me. So with that, welcome to the Good to Do podcast. My guest today... Um, is doing exactly what we're talking about. In fact, he's helped inform me on this conversation. We've had some really cool ones. This is Blaine Smith. Blaine uh, is a uh, West Point graduate. He was an officer in special forces. After transitioning out of the military, Blaine has had a really, really successful run in focusing on organizations and corporations, helping them uh, actually, he's actually a partner and principal in applied leadership, and that's exactly what he's focused on. He's making a difference, helping organizations, companies um, put it into action. Uh, prior to being a principal at Applied Leadership Partners, uh, Blaine was the president of Go Ruck. And prior to that, and this is where Blaine and I actually met, he was the executive director. And I, I he'll say this that this is probably one of the most proud, one of his one of his most proud accomplishments is executive director at Team Red, White, and Blue. And let me just tell you, Team Red, White, and Blue, if you're not familiar, has become one of the most trusted and respected organizations in the career transition supporting veteran space. Um, so with all of that. It's my pleasure, Blaine, get in here to welcome uh, my friend, Blaine Smith. Blaine, good to see you, man. Good seeing you, Steve. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I've, I've been wanting to say this, and you and I used to talk a lot about this. I remember when you were transitioning from Team Red, White, and Blue into the leadership and culture development space, and you called me and you're like, Steve, a lot of these folks, not all of them, a lot of them, there's a lot of yelling and screaming, and you said it. I'm going to tell you, this is a question. You said it in a way that was so chill and calm. I've always loved your tone of voice. That's one of the things that's very interesting about you as a leader. Let me ask you, have you heard that before? Have people commented on the fact that you are, you are an officer in special forces, you've been through a lot of intense things, and your tone is so calm and soothing? That's my opening question. <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, I appreciate you saying so. And yes, I, I do get that a lot. And you and I did a podcast many years ago when I was at Team RWB. And I just did it because I thought it would be fun. And you know, I thought it would be cool to have interesting conversations with people. And a lot of people came back to me and said, man, you really got a voice for this. Like you seem so like calm and mellow on the podcast. And I did a fair amount of kind of broadcasting stuff when I was over at Go Ruck and got very similar feedback. And I think where it comes from is actually from my time in the military and especially my time in SF, because part of my role was to was to lead these you know these men and women in really stressful situations. And one of the things I had to do a lot was talk on the radio. So I had to call back for support or call in checkpoints or you name it. I was on the radio a lot as the officer. I didn't get to do as much of the cool stuff on the ground because I was too busy talking on the radio. And one of the things that we we really believe is that cool breeds cool. And so I, I, I learned right away that in stressful situations. If I could exude calm, even if I wasn't necessarily calm on the inside, if I could at least try to exude some calm, that the people around me would also be calm. And that's super important in those things. So like my guys, when I was in the army, used to joke that I had a very white voice. So it could just be a total 
total trash situation going on around. And I would just take a breath, key the mic and try to exude as much calm as I could for the folks around. And um, I did it consciously. And I think over time, it's just kind of become become part of who I am. I love it, man. Tone is key. I've actually had conversations with you and I've been in the airport traveling a couple of years ago. And I remember being a little fired up and I remember hanging up the phone and being like, all right, I feel a little better. So well done, my friend. Let's back up a little bit. You know, you've had a lot of incredible experiences in, in special forces and also in the corporate space and leading red, white and team red, white and blue. Who are some leaders that have massively impacted you? And I'm going to kind of do a double question. What were some of the things they had in common? Who impacted you, Blaine? Because I consider you an extraordinary, calm, humble, transformational leader. Uh, who influenced you? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. And I think if I go all the way back, I have to start with my parents, which is not a cop out answer. It's just the truth. Um, I think the biggest thing I've taken away from them, you know, as leaders, as people that led our family was just to, to sort of have priorities and to focus on what matters. And I think that's something that I still find really useful in the world today with so much going on around us and so many places we could be putting our attention and things we could be worrying about. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's serious going on in the world, but there's a lot of distraction out there probably as well. And one of the things my parents taught me was to sort of control what you could control, to, to take care of what was in front of you, to worry about the variables that were within your sphere of influence, to just do your work and move forward and kind of let the chips fall where they may. Um, and I still continue to, to really tap into that now, maybe, maybe more than ever. And then I, as I got kind of Further into my my adult life, I had a, a couple mentors at West Point that were similar. I had a guy named Frank Sturck. I remember that was one of our um, one of our mentors, and I had a uh, attack officer that basically reminded me that look, you can show up as prepared and as ready as you can be, and that's all you can do. And so I just really started adopting that mindset. And um, you know, even even more recently, I remember when I transitioned from Team RDB to Go Ruck, I started working closely with my friend Jason McCarthy. And he's a really, really phenomenal leader. But one of the things that he taught me was, again, you just have to sort of do the best you can do and tell the truth. And when people are upset, just look them in the eye and say, hey, I'm sorry. You know, we screwed up. I don't know what you want me to tell you. Like, we'll try to do better the next time. And it really snapped me out of this mindset. When I was leading Team RWB, we were so inclusive that I wanted to make everybody happy all the time. Like every veteran everywhere in the world, we wanted you to have a good experience. And I really took it to heart and was crushed when someone would be upset or angry, or they had a bad experience at an event or something. And one of the things I learned from, from Jason was, Hey, this stuff happens, man. Like you're, you're doing your best. What, what do they want you to do? Take your ball and go home. Like, no, they need you in this role. They need you to keep trying. And if they're unhappy, it's, it's fine. It's not for everybody. And sometimes you just screw up. And I really have uh, taken that advice to heart too. And I've, I've gotten to a place now where I can just, you know, try, try my best. And if people are unhappy, I can say, Hey, I'm sorry. How can I help you fix it? And if they're unreasonable, then I say, all right, I did my best. I got, I got to move on. Um, and so maybe that's the common thread through all of it. Now that I'm just kind of thinking out loud is yeah, um, you can, you can prepare, you can do your best, you can try in earnest, you can be as genuine as possible. And, um, you know, what the results are going to be what they're going to be. And if they're great, great. And if they're not, you know, you did your best. And I, I find a lot of peace in that. It's so good. Um, as I'm listening to you, it just reminds me that you you really do have a unique sound. You have a unique voice. We've talked about this a little bit, Blaine, but like the tension when you have a, a space like leadership, culture development, you've got social media, you've got people that are really into marketing. Um, I know that this is gonna is not gonna catch you off guard. You're not like a flashy person. You're not a sparkle speaker, if you will. And how do you reconcile that tension between promotion? and marketing of your applied leadership company and the humility that I know is like just embedded in you. Like, I think people listening, many of them are probably struggling with that as well. Yeah. And I've, I, to be fair, I've really struggled with it over the years as well. I mean, I think my partner and I, Brandon, we talk about this a lot and we, we help each other. Uh, I'll say we're kind of accountability partners and we help each other to be patient and to be thoughtful. Um, but I've, I've looked across the internet as you have, and I've thought, man, I've, uh, we've, we've stumbled onto some stuff here. We've developed some things that we think are really good for people and we want to share our message and we want to help as many folks as we can. Um, but we really try hard to be, to be patient. 
and to take a to take a long view. Um, we've spent a lot of time digging into sort of like what we would consider to be wisdom. So whether it's philosophical, religious, you name it, we've gone back and done a lot of reading and we've dug into what is the real kind of wisdom out there? What's the timeless stuff? So we want to be timely, but more importantly, we want to give people stuff that is timeless. And what we've reconciled within ourselves and within our business is that we're just in it for the long haul and we're just willing to take our time and, you know, however long it takes to kind of build our message and to hone our craft and to, to serve people, we're willing to kind of take as much time as it takes and have a, a real relationship with not only with our clients, but with each other and with our families and with all the people that we interact with. And, and part of what allows us to do that and what's really helped me is I've, I've tried to, to develop a very healthy sense of enough. Um, and so I think I know what enough is and I'm ambitious like anybody else and I, I want to have success and make an impact on the world. I, I very much do. But I've tried really hard to think about, again, what, what really matters to me, what matters to my family, and how much is enough. And I think what we've discovered is, you know, we live pretty humbly. We try to just take care of the, the simple things in life. And we've made a good enough living to be able to support that. And so if we have five or six clients a year, it's enough. And we can feed our families and be happy and send our kids to college someday. And if we have 50 clients a year, that will be better. And we'll bring more good leaders into our firm and and try to you know spread it out a bit more. But um, whenever I feel that little bit of, of anxiety around like our audience isn't growing, our business isn't growing, you know, there are, there are folks out there, I think that are maybe sharing messages that are less healthy. You know, I just try to, to remind myself that we've got plenty of time. It's a big world. You know, I'm a small person and um, you know, if we can really transform one one business, one leader, uh, and make a big dent in their life, then like that's that's a pretty big deal. And just try to constantly remind ourselves of that. I love it. I, I just have to say it again. It's I wrote it down. I hope other people are writing it down. Uh, instead of being timely, be timeless. I mean, that's it's so simple, but that's a really complex thing to to bring down to be so concise. And the other thing that you said is healthy sense of enough. I, I love that. I, I find you and I've talked about a lot leaders. Um, if we get too um, focused on being a big brand name, um, you could end up sacrificing your own health. And in, in the process, it affects your clarity. With that, where have you had a situation, Blaine, it, whether it was when you were an officer in special forces or even as a leader in the corporate space, where you've had a problem, a challenge, if you will, you put something in place and a solution occurred so a challenge happened all right you were faced with it i'm kind of slowing it down because it's not like we prepared this question and all you put some applicable tangible information into action and a, a result that was positive occurred yeah so i'm sure i'm sure there are a lot um because when you're leading a business or leading an organization you get problems all the time and you know and you've got to figure out a way to to get a tangible solution in place to just try to make it a little bit better. Um, so maybe I would start there and I would say, one of the ways I think about this is I try to like take the next best step to make their next right move rather than try to pull back and take a long time thinking about things and then try to come up with a solution that's gonna fix everything. Cause that's rarely the case. So one of the ways I approach this very generally is that I try to just like really sit with the discomfort of the problem, or even if it's another person involved, like I try to like really lean into the discomfort and just have the hard conversation or whatever needs to happen. And then just kind of make the next best step and go from there. One thing that just kind of popped to mind is when I was uh, leading Team RWB, the team was starting to grow, the organization was growing and it got much bigger, kind of much more quickly than we anticipated. And I'm really the kind of leader that I would prefer to kind of put my hand on your shoulder and look you in the eye um, but as you get bigger and you have a distributed workforce, I mean, people are doing this now all over the, all over the world. It can be difficult to lead people when you can't see them every day and have those intimate interactions. Yeah. And, you know, our team had gotten to maybe 25 or 30 people on the staff and people were starting to say, like, I don't feel like I know what's going on all the time, or I'm not sure what's happening. And there started to be like a little bit of that chirping, which upset me. Cause I was like, man, I'm trying so hard to be transparent and like, I'm not trying to keep any secrets here. And so like, what I did is I, I created this thing called the ED Weekly. It was like the executive director's weekly report. Cool. And 
all, all I would do is I would send a thing out every Monday, a note to the staff that would say, here's like four bullets of what I did last week. I mean, it was the most boring, ridiculous stuff in the world. Like here's four things I did last week. And here are three or four things that I'm focused on this week. And then I would write a little thing at the bottom about some leadership topic or something, just something that was on my mind. And I'd say, I've been thinking about this topic and here's where my head is at. And I really struggled to do it because it felt so, it felt almost narcissistic to me. I'm like, who gives a crap what I did last week? But they loved it. Yeah. And, but within a week or two, people were like, oh, I can't, this is so important to me. I'm, I'm, I'm really feel like I know what's going on now. And it recurred to me then like over communicating as a leader, when you're doing it in earnest, when you're doing it from a place of like, Hey, I just want to be transparent. Um, it was amazing for the team. Just that little bit of time I put in to say, uh, here's, here's what went on last week. And, and here's what I'm thinking about this week because they didn't, what I found was they didn't need to know every single thing that was going on in my life. And they didn't need to be, have a hand or a say so in every decision that I made. You know, we, I found I could be inclusive by just being transparent. I didn't have to say, hey, I'm thinking about doing X, Y, and Z. What does everyone think about this? I right. want everyone to weigh in on the decision. Like, I realized I was the leader and sometimes I just had to make decisions. But informing them about my thought process and just letting them know where my head was at. Or sometimes I could just share good news and say, hey, I was at the Department of Veterans Affairs last week and I spoke to the secretary and he said, what an amazing job we're all doing. And I just wanted to share that because I get to experience that, but you don't. Um, anyway, so that's the one that jumps out as like the, maybe the smallest thing I ever did mechanically that might've had the biggest impact on my leadership. And this is why I've loved our conversations in the past, because even though that sounds simple, people love to be informed. That doesn't mean they need to have all the information. I think we're being over information and under informed. And uh, I love that you just walked that through. That is why I've always enjoyed our conversation, why I think you're a real sound voice in the applied leadership space. Um, and that example was perfect. Um, it reminded me of when, you know, you're on a plane and you're not sure what's happening. You're on the tarmac for like an hour and someone gets on the mic and they say, look, we're in this with you. We don't really have any major update, but as soon as we hear something, we're gonna let you know. And everyone's relieved. It's just that update is enough just to hear a voice to say, hey, there's no secrets as soon as we know. Anyway, I just I, the power of being informed is, is crucial. Blaine, I want to it kind of transitions me to um, thinking about when you going to West Point's no joke. OK, and then and, and you don't love talking about yourself. You're very humble, but um, I want to amplify some of your accomplishments. When you went to West Point, then you become an officer in special forces. Did you know that was your track? When did that kind of, did someone come to you and say, hey, Blaine, I think you'd be an incredible candidate to go to West Point. I mean, something has to happen. And what was that, that moment that got you thinking about that track in your early career? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked because I, uh, a lot of people make a lot of assumptions about what it is to go there or why people go there and that. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. I had very practical reasons for going to West Point. Awesome. Like, that's the truth. It was 1997 when I decided to go. So it, the world is very different. This is pre 9-11. The world is very quiet in terms of conflict at that time. Um, the army was actually drawing down and getting smaller in 1997. And I was a 17, 18 year old kid that had really good grades in high school and played some sports. And I wanted to get a great education. And I really wanted to go to Duke at the time, I remember. and. The fact of the matter was, we just really couldn't afford for me to go there. Yeah. And I talked to my parents one day about this and my mom said, I'll never forget. She said, hey, if you really want to go to Duke, we'll figure it out. And I thought that was amazing that my parents would support me in that way. But I also remember thinking, like, I don't want for my folks who have like cut grass and clean pools and driven trucks and done all the things they've done my whole life to put food on the table and support me to have to figure it out. Um, and so I had a chemistry teacher and my golf coach at high school who was a retired army officer. And he was really kind of pushing me to consider West Point or the Air Force Academy. And so I started just kind of looking in through it and going through the motions. And he said, look, just leave no stone unturned. Do me this favor and complete your application. So I was like, all right. I basically did as a favor to him. And I, so I got through the application process and then I went on a recruiting visit in December of my senior year of high school. And it was snowing and it was right after the army navy game and i was just so impressed with the place and you know west point for those that don't know you everyone that goes essentially goes on a full scholarship you incur a military service commitment which certainly makes it not free right. but 
it was a chance to get a world-class education at uh, basically at the right price. And it was a chance to challenge myself and get a little bit outside my comfort zone and try to kind of achieve my potential. And it just kind of lined up. It was a play. I had a chance to play golf at the division one level, Very cool. not incur any debt. And it just seemed like as a kid who grew up very blue collar, I had a chance to kind of punch my ticket. If I could make it for four years, I knew I would have a job. I knew I would always have a chance to make a good living and I would have good people in my life. And I just made a very practical decision to go for me, not because I had some deep calling to serve my country at the time. I just was trying to make a good decision for me and my future. And then, you know, two months after I graduated, 9-11 happened and the whole world changed. But that was not where my head was at when I made the decision to go at all. Wow. I'm so glad I asked that. And I so appreciate the way you shared it. You know, um, I love that you said practical like five times. I think it has really informed your leadership style. It's at least the, 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 the how I've been a recipient of your uh, your wisdom. As you transition from being an officer in special forces, now you're applied with brand and your business partner and you're doing applied leadership. Um, is there an audience that you're really driven towards? I know you're in the corporate space a lot. Is there a particular audience that you really um, feel uh, like you're, that your sound could really make a massive difference? I feel like there's any audience, but I'm curious for you, is there a specific group? Sure. So we, most of our work to this point has been kind of on two wings. So we've done a fair amount of work with, with nonprofit organizations because yeah. we come from that background and we have friends and colleagues that are leading nonprofits and doing amazing things. So we've been called on by them to come in and help, which has been been amazing. Like any organization that's got a, a great mission, if we can make them 1% better, you know, we really want to do that. And we empathize with leaders that are doing those hard jobs and they're, they're not getting rich and they're out in communities. So we, we love working with, with that side of, of things. Cool. We've also then the other half, we've worked like big, like billion dollar plus companies. And we, we've been really interested in that space because there's a lot of people that are like us. There's a lot of people that are, you know, 40 years old, have three kids, yep. are kind of mid career or vice presidents. And they're really, they're driven. They're, they're motivated people that care a lot about their people and their teams and their companies and their kids. And we have found a lot of, I think, I think a lot of success and a lot of resonance with people that are in this kind of high potential and high stress times of their life. So mm -hmm. tapping into leadership teams that, uh, you know, they've got whatever, six to 60 direct reports and they've got a lot of weight on their, on their shoulders and they're trying to figure out how to balance taking good care of their people and not burning them out, but also driving them toward mission success. And also, by the way, try not to lose themselves and their marriages and their yes. relationships in the process. Yes. And so true. that is where I think Brandon, I've really found our sweet spot is with these sort of really high drive kind of mid career folks that are that are trying to do it all. Yep. You know, they're not like like the 60 year old CEOs kind of seen the top of the mountain and like maybe has their regrets and maybe has earned some wisdom. And they're not maybe that 28 year old, just hard charger. That's like, has the blinders on totally you know, those folks that are kind of in that 34 to 50 range that are leading teams and have had some success and proven themselves, but are trying to get to that next level. And like I said, maybe they're a COO or a vice president or something yeah. or they're coaching or, or working with like on team alignment workshops. We're finding that Brandon and I, maybe it's just cause we're like them, you know, mm -hmm. we can come into that space and just sort of say, Hey, I get it. I know, yeah. I know it's hard right now, but like yeah. you can do it and we're, we're going to figure this out. And so we've really had a blast to be honest. It's been a lot of fun to see people's eyes kind of look up and say, Hey, okay. Okay. I, I get it. You, you see me, you know, it's, you know, it's hard. You understand like, wow, it's like, it's like, you're in my head. You, you get what I'm going through. It's like, yeah. we're going through the same thing. Cause you have empathy. I, I totally you. get it. Yeah. I love it. I love what you just said about we got to make sure we don't lose ourselves um, and and be able to lean in and say, and I'm with you. I understand the challenges of either being a husband, a wife, a, a parent, a, a father, a, a mother um, and all of it. I, I, I'm fired up. But you, the fact that you said we've got to make sure we don't lose ourselves or else we're really not going to be very effective. And then that whole leadership, quote unquote, thing is out the window because um, then you're, you're you're not healthy and clear enough to impact others. So, yeah. Our, so our mantra at Applied Leadership Partners is yeah. sustainably effective leadership. So good. 
right? Effective, sustainable. So we tell everyone we work with, hey, look, our first job is to help you become a more effective leader. You know, we, you need to accomplish your mission success. We want to help you achieve your goals and run a successful business. Like if we can't help you be more effective, then we have no business being here. So make no mistake, we're, we're trying to help you level up and be more effective. Right. But we need to help you be effective sustainably because where real success comes in life, and I'm sure if you look at people you admire, you'll notice this. Can you be good for a long time? Can you be good year over year? Can you be good in many aspects of your life? You know, can you keep it up? And if you kind of burn high, burn bright, you, you just burn out. And so we're trying to help people be effective, yes, but we're trying to give them techniques and approaches and frameworks to be effective in ways they can do it sustainably. So that way, five years from now, they still have the same core team at their work, you know, and they're, and they're still fired up to come to work every day. Um, it's a, you can accomplish some amazing stuff if you can stay at it for two, three, four, ten 10 years. Yeah. That power of compounding, that incremental improvement, it's a big deal. And if you don't commit to it over the long haul, you just you never really get there. And so sustainably effective is really kind of the watch phrase that we we lean on. And you said this before as well, like substance over sparkle, things that can be consistently done over a period of time and not complicating it. OK, I'm going to go back to where kind of we started, Blaine, and I want to ask you how much of your tone and sound, because that's what we started with. And I do as I've listened to you and and share with you it is your, your sound and tone is so needed in this space. At least I feel this way. And I hope listeners and viewers see that as well, that we do not always have to be jumping up and down, screaming and yelling, throwing out just catchphrase after catchphrase um, and think that that's going to be a sustainable change. How much of what you learned as an officer in special forces were you able to transition to the corporate space and, and and share with me some of the things in that military space that doesn't transfer as well because i'm seeing a lot of like the, the the folks that have led in the military space taking those and applying them to the real world but are there some things blaine that need to stay in that military space because the stakes are so different yeah so maybe i'll take the second part first because i think you're bringing up a really good point and i've spoken a lot about this and cool. so uh in a lot of leadership seminars and stuff that i've coached i've reminded people that and, I, and i've worked with a lot of transitioning veterans obviously over my career and I, I remind them that leadership in the military in some ways is easier than leadership outside because you have three things really working in your advantage and i call them authority immediacy and homogeneity well, and these are perfect but i think they're a good framework to think about things through so you know in, in the military when you're a leader you have no kidding UCMJ, Uniform Code of Military Justice, you have a real authority over people. If you give them a, a lawful order to do something, they have to do it or it's against the law. Like that's wow. no joke. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be a good order. It doesn't have to be a smart one. It doesn't have to be the, the right one. As long as it's not illegal or immoral, they got to do it. Wow. You know, I can tell you to go, you know, mop the motor pool in the rain and you have to go do that. If it's wow. not illegal and it's not immoral, right? So you have authority in the military when you're leading that you just simply do not have really almost anywhere else outside the military. The second one is, is immediacy, right? It's high stakes. Yes. So if you and I are walking on a patrol in the woods, you know, in Northern Afghanistan and people start shooting at us and I'm the commander, I say, you know, you go over there, you get behind that rock and shoot that way. You get on the radio and call for air support, whatever. There is no time for you to say, well, you know, Blaine, I've thought about it. And that rock actually looks a little better to me. Let's so look at the data. Maybe. The data. Yeah, there's no doubt. No, you have immediacy. And so you tell people to do something and they, and they have to do it. We're trained and drilled to do that. And then the last one is a little controversial, but I would say you have a lot more homogeneity in the military. So even if people look different and come from different walks of lives and have different perspectives and experiences, you know, the kind of young man that signs up and becomes a, a rifleman in an infantry platoon, you know, they're fairly similar to the other young men that are in that platoon. And you have a, a way of being able to talk to them and interact with them and lead them that you can have a bit more of a one size fits all. They're definitely individuals, but you can have a little bit more of that, be a little bit more of a blunt instrument in that environment. And again, that's really not true in, in places outside the military. So I, I had to think through that as I was leading a team RWB and trying to get all these military veterans to lead in communities as volunteers now. Right. I thought hard about like, hey, what, what, where are the, the potential pitfalls or hiccups? Yeah. 
in transitioning your military leadership. So I tried to put that right out front for them and say, look, here's some things you don't have anymore. And I think that was a nice place to start. Then I would dig into the things that really do transfer. And so I would say, to answer the first part of your question, good. so much of what I learned in the special forces especially works uh, in the rest of the world. And, and some of it, it is a bit unique. So I think clarity of purpose and priority is so important. You know, when you're in the special forces, you have a very small team, sometimes in a very hostile remote environment, and you can't do everything. You got to be really thoughtful about every muscle movement, every relationship you build, every time you leave the wire, every operation you go on. You don't have the luxury of having like a big battalion of tanks behind you that can mask your screw ups like you are exposed and you got to be really, really thoughtful about what you do. Um, and I've learned that the hard way. And so I think when I go into organizations now that are like trying to do everything and they're you know trying to boil the ocean or we want to get that done, or we're trying to grow super fast. And we're trying to do everything. One of the things I really try to help people with is like, let's slow down a little bit and think about your priorities. If you can't articulate your priorities, you don't really know what you're doing. You're probably out of control. And if you're, if your people aren't really, really clear on the priorities, they're probably spinning too. And you know, what I found was true in SF and I find is true almost everywhere else we go. Now, if you have smart people, that are reasonably motivated, if you give them clear priorities and kind of what we'd call commander's intent in the military, they'll go, Yeah, they'll do it. And I, and I find that we get either on one end or the other when it comes to leadership outside the military. We have p people who, uh, you know, either they, they want control and so they're kind of micromanaging. We still see a lot of that. Like, I wanna tell people how to do things. I wanna have control. I wanna control information. I don't wanna give out too much. I wanna like, there, there are still a lot in corporate America of, of folks that kind of want to have control. That's fairly toxic. Um, but we've seen a big shift the other way, Steve, and I'm sure you've seen this too, of people that like, they don't want to be a micromanager at all cost. Right. It's like, like, I don't want to be a micromanager. And I hear a lot of like, I got great people. I just want to get out of their way. I just want to stay out of the weeds. I just want to let them go. You know, it's my job just to like hire good people and let them do their thing. And I, I, I think that's wrong. I agree. No, it's not like your job as a leader is to lead. Your job as a leader is to make decisions. Your job as a leader is to create priorities and share those priorities with your people. Smart people, great people want to be led. If you are their leader, they want you to lead them. Nice. And I think that gets missed a lot in this thing. And so I've, I've actually seen a lot of people go way too laissez faire. Yeah. And what we end up with is a lot of really smart people that want to do the right thing, but are not exactly quite sure what to be doing. No direction. And and they're trying their best or they'll make a mistake and then they have to go back and fix it because the leader's like, no, that's not what I wanted. And it's like, hey, if you're the leader, you have to lead. And I think there's a there's a sweet spot in there that is oftentimes kind of getting missed because people are either like controlling and trying to like, you know, be in charge of everything because it's the only way they feel comfortable. Yeah. Or they're like, I don't want to be a micromanager. So they go way hands off. And I think neither of those approaches is really, really the way to do it. The way you shared both answers to those questions is what I appreciate so much about your transfer from being a officer to being in the corporate space. And 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 I just want to kind of reiterate a couple of things you said, Blaine, that resonate with me. When I, as a, someone who never served in the military but has friends like you and Mike Irwin and some unbelievably accomplished uh, veterans, it always pains me when people are like it's a war out there when they're talking about a, a business situation i just find that to be actually like really like offensive and i appreciate you so much this isn't a question i appreciate you so much being humble enough to take what worked but also being aware enough of what doesn't fit in the corporate space because like you said the stakes are different um and a lot of the decisions we're making in the corporate space are not life and death and thank you for being that sound voice okay i want to go back to present time um, and this will be, uh, my last question, Blaine, good to do. You are truly, uh, for me, one of the best at taking information and just making it simple and applicable. And I, I'm going to read a few notes after this question on things that really resonated with me. What are you going to do like currently today, maybe tomorrow that is going to help you improve? Like just a simple, basic, practical, good to do. Don't make it complicated for you personally as a leader. Like for me, I'm trying to like turn my technology off 30 minutes before I go to bed so I don't have my brain racing. Share what does Blaine Smith do that's a basic, simple, practical, good to do so people can get their pen out and write it down. Yeah. I put you on the spot there, buddy. 
No, that's good. I think the biggest thing for me is I have to move my body. Yes. And get outside the four walls of my home. Like there are a lot of little things I try to do to be better, but the biggest thing for me, the thing that I can say I've done consistently my whole life that's helped me. Yes. Is I try, I, I think about it as being human. Yeah. You know, sitting here and, and looking at the screen as much as I enjoy our conversation, Steve, totally. it's not really, I don't think what human beings are made to do. And so I think about like, how can I just get outside and go for a walk? How yes. can I go for a run? How can I train? Like I take my physical fitness still very seriously and I take time outdoors very seriously. And I find that that helps me more than anything as a, as a leader, as a dad, is I have to take some time every day to sort of be a human and like get my heart rate up, break a sweat, breathe fresh air. Um, and I don't think you have to be like a, a, an Olympic athlete or a CrossFitter or a triathlete. You don't have to be any of those things to, to be human. So I think if you go take, take a step back from trying to train or trying to work out or exercise even, whatever you want to call it. If you just think of it as like being human, like get some locomotion, you know, get some steps, <laughs> breathe some air, feel the grass under your feet. It, it's just a great reframe for me uh, and, a, and a great stress reliever and all of that. So that's the biggest one if I had to impart on anybody that I think everyone can do is just get some movement, spend some time outdoors and make it a priority, like make it a no miss thing that even if you have to take a conference call, whatever you've got to do, like we've got to do more of that because it gets us gets us in touch with being human and like we could all use a little bit more humanity right now. I would oh, say. What a perfect way to wrap that up. I love how practical you are, Blaine, and you've you've shown it in this conversation. We're not going to go viral by tweeting, move your body, right? No one's going to give you a standing ovation like, oh, Blaine was so epic. He like landed some hot fire by spitting be locomotion, you know, but it's, it's what I appreciate so much about you, your humility to say your children need to be heard and seen. Don't be timely, be timeless. Um, have a healthy sense of enough, move your body. Uh, I love the sustainability effective and leader. I, I, I love your sound. I really do. I appreciate it. I think we do need it more than ever. Thank you for being a sound voice in the applied leadership space. Um, and I really appreciate you sharing your time and uh, your wisdom and uh, your humility. Appreciate it so much, man. Yeah, of course. Anytime, man. Thanks for what you're doing and thanks for having me. Uh, if you are new to the Good To Do podcast, welcome. We're so glad that you're joining us. We hope that we're growing together because we're in this together. If you're joining us on YouTube, please uh, click the like and the, the ring the bell notification and let us know that you're there so we can continue to pr provide content and, and share. If you found that this was impactful, you know, share it with your friends. We want to figure out ways we can take all this information that's out there and transfer it to simple, practical results. 